If the function g is continuous for all real numbers, and if g of x is equal to x squared minus x minus 6 over x minus 3 for all x not equal to 3, then g of 3 equals... Okay, well, first I just want to uh, write x squared minus x minus 6 over x minus 3 in another form. We're going to factor x squared minus x minus 6. And very often in calculus problems, especially ones involving continuity and limits, there's usually a very big hint as to how to factor. One of the factors is very often, uh, if you're in the numerator, then look in the denominator to see what one of the factors is. Probably x minus 3 is one of the factors, and in fact it is. x squared minus x minus 6 factors as x minus 3 times x plus 2, right? x squared, the outer is 2x minus 3x is negative x, and negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and uh, compute g of 3, which since it's continuous, we know that it's equal to the limit as x goes to 3 of x squared minus x minus 6 over x minus 3, which we just saw that we can simplify x squared minus x minus 6 as x minus 3 times x plus 2. Now, when you're taking a limit, uh, we don't care what's happening at 3. So we can uh, cancel out the x minus 3 on the top and the bottom. And we just get the limit as x goes to 3 of x plus 2, which we can now get by substituting a 3 in for x. We get 3 plus 2 is equal to 5. Okay, what is the limit as h goes to 0? of tan of pi over 4 plus h minus tan of pi over 4 all over h. Okay, I'm going to show you two different ways to do this. One is by using the definition of the derivative. So if we let f of x equal tan x, then remember the definition of the derivative f prime of x is the limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. For us, f of x is tan x, so let's put that in there, right? f of x plus h is tan x plus h, and f of x is tan x. And if we compare that to what we have in the question there, we see that that's equal to f prime of pi over 4, right? So I'm just replacing x by pi over 4. Now, f of x is tan x, and using one of our rules, the derivative of tan x is secant squared x. Okay, and plugging in the pi over 4, well, secant squared of pi over 4, if you know that the cosine of pi over 4 is 1 over root 2, and secant is the reciprocal of cosine, right? So then secant of pi over 4 is root 2. And remember, secant squared pi over 4 is an abbreviation for the square of the secant of pi over 4. So we want to take the square of root 2, which is 2. Now I'm going to show you another way to do it, which is actually a little quicker, I think, in this case, using L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so to take that limit, notice it's of the form uh, 0 over 0, right? If you plug in a 0 for h, you get tan pi over 4 minus tan pi over 4, which is 0. And in the denominator, you also get a 0. Whenever you have the form 0 over 0, you can apply L'Hopital's rule. And to do that, you take the derivative of the top. The derivative of tangent pi over 4 plus h is secant squared pi over 4 plus h. Technically, there's a little chain rule times the derivative of pi over 4 plus h is 0 plus 1 or just 1, but I didn't bother writing that. And the derivative of h on the bottom is just 1. So now we can go ahead and plug in the 0 for h here, and we get the secant squared of pi over 4, which just like in the last solution was the square of root 2 or 2. What is the limit as x goes to infinity of 5 minus x squared plus 3x cubed over x cubed minus 2x plus 3? Okay. So all we're going to do is we're going to take the highest power of x on the top, which is x cubed, right? And forget everything else because it's negligible. So 3x cubed. And same thing on the bottom. Highest power of x is x cubed. And take this limit. Since we're taking the limit as x goes to infinity, we can 
cancel out those x cubes and just get three. Remember, if the degree on top and the bottom are the same, you just get the coefficient. If the degree on the bottom is bigger, you're going to get zero. And if the degree on the top is bigger, you're going to get infinity or possibly minus infinity. Let f be the function defined by, well, we have this piecewise defined function. f of x is 5e to the x minus 7 over 1 plus the ln of absolute x minus 8 if x is less than or equal to 7. And f of x is 15 times cosine x minus 7 over sine 7 minus x plus 3 if x is greater than 7. Let's show that f is continuous at x equals 7. Okay, so there are two parts to showing continuity. We have to show that the limit exists and also that the function is defined at 7. And most importantly, we have to show that those two things are equal. f of 7 and the limit as x goes to 7 are the same. So let's start with the limit. Since the function is piecewise defined, we're going to want to check the limit from the left and the limit from the right separately. So for the limit from the left, limit as x goes to 0 from the left of f of x, well, we're going to plug a 7 into the one up top because that's where x is less than or equal to 7. And there are no issues just plugging in the 7, no indeterminate forms or anything. Right, so we just get 5e to the 7 minus 7 is 5e to the 0, and ln of absolute 7 minus 8. The absolute value of 7 minus 8 is 1. Okay, e to the 0 is 1, ln 1 is 0, so we just get 5. And now let's do the limit as x goes to 7 from the right of f of x. Since we're to the right of 7, we're greater than 7, and we use the second part of the piecewise defined function here. And again, we could just plug in because there are no tricky limits here. So it's just 15 cosine 7 minus 7 over the sine of 7 minus 7 plus 3. So we get uh, 7 minus 7 is 0, both on the top and the bottom. Cosine of 0 is 1. Sine of 0 is 0. So we just get 15 thirds, which is 5. Great. So the limit from the left and the limit from the right match up. They're both equal to 5, which means that the limit as x goes to 7, f of x exists and is equal to 5. Also, f of 7 itself, we get from the top one because this is where it's less than or equal to. And again, we're just plugging in the 7, which is exactly the same thing we did for the limit from the left. So we know we're going to get the same thing. We're going to get 5 there. Okay, so we see that the limit as x goes to 7, f of x, is equal to f of 7, which is exactly what it means for f to be continuous at x equals 7. Let f be defined by f of x equals 1 over the square root of 17 minus x squared plus the square root of x minus 3 for x between negative 2 and 10, inclusive. Let g be defined by g of x is this piecewise defined function, f of x plus 2 for x between negative 2 and 4, and it's the absolute value of x minus 8 for x between 4 and 10, not including 4 but including 10. Is g continuous at x equals 4? Use the definition of continuity to explain your answer. Okay, so first let's take the limit as x goes to 4 from the left, g of x. For that, we're using the top piece, right? 4 from the left is over here. So we plug the 4 into here, f of 4 plus 2, and we hope that plugging in the 4 will work. Well, f of 4 we get from here, right? So that's 1 over the square root of 17 minus 4 squared plus the square root of 4 minus 3. And don't forget the plus 2 over here. Okay, so that's equal to uh, 4 squared is 16. 17 minus 16 is 1. So it's just 1 over root 1, which is 1. 4 minus 3 again is 1. The square root of 1 is 1 plus 2. So we get 4. And... Let's now compute the limit as x goes to 4 from the right of g of x. For that, we use the second function here. Here's to the right of 4. Right? So that's absolute 4 minus 8, which is the absolute value of negative 4, which is, again, 4. Great. So the limit exists because the limit from the left and the right are the same, and it's equal to the common value. It's equal to 4. Also, g of 4 we get by just plugging 4 into here because this is where x is equal to 4. So that's f of 4 plus 2, which we already did that whole computation here. f of 4 plus 2, we got 4. Great. So the limit as x goes to 4, g of x is equal to g of 4, which once again is exactly what it means for g to be continuous 
at x equals 4. The differentiable function f is defined for all real numbers x. Values of f and f prime for various values of x are given in the table below. Find the x coordinate of each relative maximum of f on the interval 0, 3, closed interval 0, 3. Justify your answers. All right, well, first of all, from this table, we see that there are two critical numbers, 1 and 2, right? Because those are the only two places where the derivative is 0. Right? Everywhere else, here the derivative is 3, here the derivative is positive, here the derivative is positive, here it's negative, here it's negative 5. These are the only two places where the derivative is 0. Those are the two critical numbers. Those are the only two candidates for where there could be a relative maximum. Right? They, they have to occur at critical numbers. Okay, so notice that the, the function is increasing from 0 to 1, right, because the derivative is positive. It's also increasing from 1 to 2 because the derivative is positive. And what about from 2 to 3? Well, you guessed it. It's decreasing there because the derivative is negative. So the basic shape of the graph looks like this. It's increasing. It levels off briefly because the derivative is 0 here, but then it continues to increase. So there's not a maximum there. And then once it hits 2, it comes up, and then it starts coming down. So you can see that this is the only place where there's going to be a relative maximum, x equals 2. Consider the differential equation dy dx equals y plus 1 over x and the figure below. On the axes provided, sketch a slope field for the differential equation at the 12 points indicated. And for y greater than negative 1, sketch the solution curve passing through the point negative 1, 0. Then describe all points in the xy plane, x non-zero, for which dy dx is equal to negative 1. Okay, this, this question is actually three things in one, right? So the first part is to sketch a slope field for the differential equation at the 12 points indicated. So how do you sketch the slope field? Well, you have to plug in each of these points into here to see the derivative, and that gives you the slope at that point, right? So for example, if I plug in this point here is the point 1, 0. So if I plug in a 1 for x and a 0 for y, I get 0 plus 1 over 1, which is 1. So the derivative at this point is 1, which means we're going to get a slope, which is a perfect 45-degree angle, because that's what slope of 1 looks like, right? Rise over run, up 1 over 1, right? So let's draw the slope field here. See the one I just did there? That's a slope of 1. Um, notice that this one also has a slope of 1. That's the point to 1. So when we plug in a 2 for x and a 1 for y, we get 1 plus 1, which is 2 over 2, which is also 1. That also has a slope of 1 there. When y is equal to negative 1, you can see that the slope's going to be 0, right? Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. doesn't matter what x is, as long as it's not 0. Notice that there are no points here because that these uh, any points along the y-axis here, x would be 0, and that's a problem in this uh, expression over here. Right? But when y is negative 1, we're always going to get a slope of 0. When y is equal to 0, we get 1 over x. So here it's 1 over 1. Here it's 1 over 2. You can see it's, the slope here is 1 half. Here it's 1 over negative 1, slope of negative 1. And here's the slope of negative 1 half. Okay? And so on. And you could compute these slopes as well. Okay. So... The second part is for y greater than negative 1, sketch the solution curve passing through the point negative 1, 0. Negative 1, 0 is right here. You can see the slope is here. And if we follow that, oh, look, the slope is still like that. It looks like it's going to be a straight line, at least a line segment, because it's not going to be defined here, right? That It's not defined on the x-axis. So it's part of a line is what I should say, right? It's this part of the line, kind of like a half line. Okay. Then describe all points in the xy plane, x non-zero, for which dy dx is equal to negative 1. So we're setting dy dx equal to negative 1, but dy dx is y plus 1 over x. So let's make that little substitution there. Multiply by x, and we get y plus 1 equals negative x. And if we bring the uh, negative 1 over, subtract 1 from each side, we see that we have a nice equation of a line in slope-intercept form. Oh, it's exactly this line, right? And that is the answer to the third part of the question.